Well, the verdict is already in for the former mayor of Las Vegas, New Mexico. The jury was asked to decide on two criminal counts. And after about an hour and a half of deliberating, those jurors came back with guilty verdicts. Let's get to Chris Ramirez in Las Vegas tonight. Chris, you have covered this case from the very, very beginning. Those allegations surfaced back in 2019. You've been in court all week long. What is your sense here? You know this case better than anybody. Were you surprised at this verdict? Well, what I will say, Tessa, is that prosecutors really put forward very compelling evidence, including text messages to her boyfriend, where she accuses her boyfriend of only being with her so that he can get city contracts. The state put forward 13 witnesses. That's in contrast to Gudele Hidon's attorney, who did not put forward any evidence or any witnesses for the jury. And those were gambles that did not pay off for this now convicted felon, disgraced ex mayor. These are some of the latest words. These are the last words that the jury heard before they made their final decisions today. The city of Las Vegas elected Ms. Gurley Heron to serve with honor and, te and integrity, and she betrayed that trust. And just as the city had the power to put her in office, you now have the power to hold her accountable. I told you there are people that would not like Tonita. You heard that from witnesses. Ladies and gentlemen, remember, not being liked, picking a boyfriend that you don't get along with are not crimes in New Mexico. So sentencing will be at a later date. Each of those guilty charges carries 18 months in prison. So at this point, the former mayor now faces up to three years in a state prison. I mean, it's downright dangerous in some of our schools lately. So many fights, in fact. Local school officials have sent letters to parents because social media may be fanning the flames of this bad behavior. Ryan Laughlin spoke to school leaders about this troubling trend and also found out how we could try and stop it. Fights at school are nothing new. But this year, KOB4 has received numerous calls from concerned parents about school violence. Yeah, yeah. It's just coming out of the pandemic, I think there was a real emotional release. Albuquerque Public School Superintendent Scott Elder says the challenges of returning to the classroom this year are unprecedented. So they left as seventh graders and came back as ninth graders, really. And but the last time they were around people, they were these younger people. So they're still adjusting socially to this new uh, new reality of their age. APS does not share information on disciplinary actions. An elder says it's hard to quantify if school fights are increasing. But he did write this letter to parents titled Student Behavior, Safety, and Social Media about a month ago. We were beginning to see a trend and we're hearing from our schools that there was a lot of, uh, of fights going on and just behaviors that we were really concerned about. In the letter, Elder says staffing shortages are complicating the problem, and that's something parents are noticing. It's great to have teachers involved, but teachers are already stretched so thin, and they don't have many breaks, and they don't get paid very much as it is. So we need APS police to step it up and have more presence here on campus. In the letter, Elder said the APS police department was short 11 officers and 18 campus security aides. And the district still has over 260 teaching vacancies and as many educational assistance jobs open as they had during the summer, still more than 200. Concerns about fighting first surfaced in September. Volcano Vista High School's principal wrote a letter saying they've seen an increase in fighting and bystanders recording it. Elder's letter followed. The social media has such an amazing impact on them that I'm not really sure those of us of a certain age truly understand how deeply ingrained it is into their lives. And it's not just an issue at one high school. Parents have sent us Instagram accounts dedicated to sharing fights and bad behavior at middle schools. We even found some private accounts that do the same thing. What the f is it? Go! You know, we've had students get in trouble and, and when their parents have confronted them about it, they've said, yeah, but this many people liked it on the social media platform and that seemed to be more important to them. You know, we, we really need to start addressing that with our education and, and how we talk to our kids about what we truly value. It's powerful. Dr. C is a local pediatrician. She says she's seen an increase in behavioral issues with kids. I think that some of it gets to be blamed on social media, unfortunately. And I think it does become sort of a big show of, you know, look at what I can do 
and look at what I can get away with. The social media giant Facebook now at the center of a national debate surrounding potentially new federal regulations. The company's leadership knows how to make Facebook and Instagram safer, but won't make the necessary changes because they have put their astronomical profits before people. A whistleblower testifying before Congress saying Facebook exploits the worst of human behavior to keep users coming back. Combine that with the stresses kids have to transition back to in-person learning. But you put a teenager home with a parent or a grandparent or some other caregiver for a year and a half, 24-7, there's going to be conflict. And I think that that conflict is now, unfortunately, like translating into some school behaviors. School leaders say they discipline troublemakers and those recording it, but they say they need help outside of school. You know, a lot of times kids get to high school, middle school, they don't really tell parents everything that's going on, and we thought it was important to begin a conversation. A conversation school leaders and experts hope will lead to solutions. I think that we have to target the root of it, and that's going to need teamwork from parents, mental health professionals, primary care doctors, schools, all working together to address the issues and also to teach kids that there are consequences when things happen, when they misbehave. And patience as kids get comfortable with a new normal. I'm so happy that kids are back in school and a lot of kids are thrilled to be back in school and I don't think it's going to be easy for a while. I think kids will have to readjust. Ryan Laughlin, KOB4. Among the thousands of New Mexicans who've lost someone they love to COVID-19 over the last year is Shauna Simpson and her family. So unfair, like we always wonder, we always ask like, why? Why our family? The pain of losing someone hit her Northern New Mexican family over and over and over again. One by one, it was like my uncle was sick and then all of a sudden, my, my grandpa was. Last May, four of her family members were all at different hospitals, each one with COVID-19. It's just phone calls, waiting for phone calls from this doctor, this doctor. Many decisions to be made, but little time to reflect what was happening. Go, 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 go. Her grandparents, Nelson and Vicki Bedoni, her mother, Cheryl Tully, and her uncle, Danny Tully, all got incredibly sick. I asked them, like, are you okay? Are you, like... When I can come home. That was the last thing Rebecca Tully said to her dad. I told him to wait for me and I only got as far as twin arrows <clears throat> and they told me that he passed away. And I couldn't see him after that, so I just had to turn around. Shauna and her family would eventually see all four family members die just a few days apart. A loss felt so deeply. I can't believe they're all gone. It's just like they got taken from us. It's still unbelievable. It's like every day is we're just hoping that, you know, it's a dream. We're just going to wake up from and we're just going to see them all back home again. And... <laughs> but uh, it's hard. They want you to know theirs is a family you couldn't forget. At home, I guess. Between their food. They love to tease and joke. Roaring laughter. Sometimes it was kind of <laughs> a little, a little much, but if you could handle it, it was, it was funny. <laughs> and music. Me and my brother, we got into gospel singing just because of my grandma. Shauna says they did everything together in life and even in death. My grandma passed first and then 30 minutes, my grandfather followed. In their last moments, in the same room, side by side, Shauna says, although it hurts, it was true to who they were. As my grandma's walking into heaven or whatever, I'm like, my grandpa's like shuffling behind her and then I can see my grandma turning around like, what are you doing here? And because my grandpa was like that. Like my grandma 
would always want to kind of just go into town by herself or somewhere by herself and my grandpa would always want to follow and she'd be like can you just let me go by myself you always follow me shauna and rebecca say they don't know if the feeling of unfairness will ever go away it doesn't it doesn't care it just comes in and takes what it can even though the virus forced them to question their faith they recognize this I thank God for blessing us with a family like them every day. Oh, that's beautiful. Megan Abundis, KOB4.